This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And our guest this week is friend of the show, Christina Giacona, director of the Los Angeles New Music Ensemble and an instructor of Native American music at the University of Oklahoma. She joins us from Oklahoma this Sunday morning. Thanks for being on the show, Christina. Thank you for having me again. It's great to be here. So, Christina, you guys are uh, uh, just finished up some shows in Los Angeles yes. this summer. And uh, I was wondering, because you have a video online of playing uh, um, in a bar, the Terry Riley piece in C, and uh, it's a blast. Like, it's the most raucous NC I've ever <laughs> yes. seen. Did you do anything like that this summer? Uh, yeah. Actually, our last concert was through the Classical Revolution uh, concert series. And our last concert was in a bar. And it was probably the most exciting concert I've ever played because there were about, I don't know, 30 to 50 people completely silent, not even ordering drinks in a bar. And then we got wow. a standing ovation. So Wow. <laughs> Very nice. Did We've they had, know what uh, they were in for when they came to the bar? Or was it I like think, a surprise? Yeah, right. Classical music. <laughs> right. I think they knew what they were getting in for. But uh, I'm sure there were a few people who were quite surprised. Awesome. Did Did you tweak it out on the weird side a little bit for them? Like challenge yeah. the bar folks? We did. Actually, our last piece was about 18 minutes long. Without It's not in movements. So it was 18 minutes of music straight. And it was really completely silent. And in our, you know, brief pauses of silence, everybody was like listening, waiting for more. So it's pretty yeah. good. Sophisticated audience in a bar. Yeah. yeah. How, does, how does the movement of drinks work in that? Because sometimes it can be a little problematic at places here in New York, like Le Poisson Rouge or something. Yeah. Uh, the stage was actually right next to the bar. Um, and so people have said that sometimes somebody will order something that needs the blender. And it becomes quite loud. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Like, I'm surprised. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. You should, a new music series that's all run through bars, and the name of the new music series is No Daiquiris for You. <laughs> exactly. No margaritas. Uh, only on the rocks. That's right. Only on the rocks. That There's the title. <laughs> only on the rocks. <laughs> um, that's kind of a problematic you, thing in alternative performance spaces is, the, is dynamics. Yes. Yeah, yeah. For for places like that, I mean, like the, it's fantastic to to be able to perform in these kind of venues. But um, you know, what is the well, difference? Popular between... music basically doesn't have any dynamics. But but what if it's what if it's you know I'm, you're performing new classical music and and Dave McDonald wrote um, FF and he wrote FFF and like is there like such a difference between that you know at this bar? Yeah. No. Uh, I guess you can do varyings of loud, but varyings of soft. Uh, yeah. Actually, we put out a call for scores, and one of the pieces uh, really dealt with colors of playing piano. And so uh, we started out playing piano, and we progressively got to mezzo forte, and then forte. Uh, so it's definitely the softs are the problem. Uh, I guess you could set up a sound system, but playing soft would still be slightly different. Mm -hmm. Not going to yeah. do quartet for the end of time at a bar, probably. Uh, <laughs> probably not, but uh, the piano might, that they had actually would be perfect for that piece. Perfectly <laughs> not in tune. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, okay. <laughs> authentic. On a period yeah, instrument. authentic. Thing. There you go. Um, and you're recording an album that you've already done all the heavy lifting on, and you're just in post-production right now? Correct. Um, who are the, is this the result of your call for scores? Uh, some of the pieces are, some of them are things we previously recorded. Uh, so the Joseph Eatson piece that, uh, you know, we'll listen to later on, uh, was through the call for scores and we actually are going to make a music video that's going to go along with it. Um, I'll talk about the piece, I guess, when we get to it, but I'll show you my video game. We are making a, uh, video game <laughs> music video and each of the members striking... that play. Yes. I made that on my <laughs> iPad. That's a striking um, likeness. It's you, right? It is me. A striking uh, likeness. And so that's going to go when the you know music video is done will probably be the same time that uh, the, the CD is released. Um, and uh, David Drexler was another winner of ours. Uh, and so his piece is going to be featured on the album. And then um, some others are just pieces we previously recorded by Mark Mellitz, um, our violinist Patrick Conlon. 
and we're trying to get a Barrio piece on there, but we're going through copyright problems. So we will see what happens. Hmm. Patrick specializes no, in- No, I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick What's works for Boozy and Hawks. I'll ha I should have a weekly column like Dear Abby or something like that. Yes. That should be a weekly weekly feature is, is, yeah. is Dear Jerk from the Publishing Company, why can't I do the thing that I want to do? See, the the, the, mis, the misconception is that that we're jerks and we're not jerks. Well, it's exactly true because obviously you want the music to be used because you get paid when it gets used correctly. Right? That is true. <laughs> I mean, it, as from a business standpoint, yes. But I mean, like, for me personally, too, I I genuinely, like, want to see music being played everywhere. So the more, you know. Especially more, Barrio. Oh, of course, Barrio. What's the as Barrio piece you're trying to get? Trombonist. I can't. I can't knock Barrio. What, what's the Barrio piece you're trying to you, you're trying to get on this disc? It's called O King. Oh, okay. So, uh, it what's great about it, it has a soprano voice who uh, sings the syllables of Martin Luther King's name throughout the piece. Interesting. I like it. Yeah. So Very tell me Barrio about this. Kind of this thing. Tell me about this music video. This is really interesting to me. <laughs> uh, uh, it's actually homage to video, like, I guess, uh, old school video games. And so uh, when uh, the video starts, it's going to be the start, you know, screen of uh, when you're playing like an arcade game. Uh, and then it's actually going to be a journey to finding the instruments. And so some will be, you know, buried. Some will be if you hit the square. And uh, at the end of the video, we want to have a Final Fantasy fight. Um and then, of course, the musicians win at the end. Of course. The power of music. Right. Oh. <laughs> right. Obviously. Oh, power of so, music. so this is all. This is all an animated. <laughs> it deal. is. Uh, yes, there is going to be a few clips of us. Um, we just we actually uh, film some footage as if we were video game characters. Uh, but yeah, the majority of it is going to be all animated through the eight bit uh, system, which takes a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm about 50 shots in, which equals about 30 seconds of, you know, of time. Oh, so are you, are you doing the whole animation? Yes, and our violinist. So I'm doing the animate. Uh, I'm making the characters like I showed you. Um, and amazing. I've made backdrops. And then we're going to animate it in Flash. Wow. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it's a good summer project. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yes. You know, the joke about the guy who's doing his animation final struggles for six weeks and works and works and works and shows that his family and it's an animation of a stick figure walking across a blank space. Look at that! Yeah! <laughs> yeah, but sometimes those are really difficult to make, like that um, that IBM video that captures the atoms, and like the world's, the world's tiniest video. About? Oh! I haven't seen this. Yeah, I think, it's, yes. It's on YouTube. Just trend, It's trending on YouTube. God, trending. be in the cultural site, guys, Sam. I <laughs> I know what you're talking about now. Yeah. There's too many disc golf videos to watch to watch. <laughs> so, Christina, right. what else is new for the uh, Los Angeles New Music Ensemble then? Other than spending way too many hours making a music video? <laughs> yeah. What are the plans uh, for the coming year besides the uh, video? So uh, we have two main projects. Uh, our call for scores was so successful this year. And so uh, we want to do that again. So we received over 100 submissions this year. Wow. So maybe we'll hopefully double that. Um, but the idea is uh, we came across the problem of wanting to play classical music, but there hasn't always been uh, piano available. So uh, especially when you're doing the locations that aren't really specifically for classical music. Right. Uh, so the call for scores that like we did this year uh, is going to be for the same instrumentation in the year coming up. It's going to be for flute, clarinet, violin, and cello. Uh, and the goal is to get that set instrumentation to be just as popular as the string quartet. Okay, that's going to take like, I don't know, 150 <laughs> years. But yeah, good luck <laughs> we thought it would be a start. Um, and then the other project is... Uh, what we would like to do is actually commission uh, some works for the same instrumentation by video game composers or composers who are inspired by video game music or video games um, and do a concert or multiple concerts uh, 
from coast to coast uh, promoting that type of music, maybe to hopefully get some more uh, fans of, um, you know, the new music uh, that might not come out for, say, a Beethoven concert or something like that. So I don't want to make this like right. a Jerry Seinfeld question, but what's the deal with video games? <laughs> well, I'm what's actually not really a gamer. Okay. So uh, for me, it's actually when uh, n- this would never cross my mind until we played the Joseph Eatson piece uh, this last time. and Everybody in the bar loved it. Um, so I thought it just might be a fun way to, uh, you know, get some audience excitement. But of course... So. There's a lot of people who have, uh, who you know, the people maybe are trying to reach out to really grew up in the video game, you know, the the initial consoles that came out. Um, and that's probably a fantastic way to to get some buzz going about that. I know that there are a few orchestras that play video games out there, and I believe they're fairly successful um, yeah. just because the, you know, everyone knows these themes and they want to hear them in, in a live um, concert setting. It, I mean, this this sounds like a great opportunity to gather more, more to the crowd here. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, and, and we just had, uh, you know, Mirna Shim, our friend from San Francisco, playing flute with uh, Game Boy on the show, what two months ago or so, and when we've talked to uh, Tristan Parrish, who codes all. Of his stuff at a very very low level even you know below simpler level than a game boy um for for his one bit music and it is a really interesting thing it, the one bit music ends up having very similar timbres and characteristics to the the game boy music because it's generated in a similar way um and i, I it's a it's an interesting trend and i think the the I guess Patrick, you were saying that there's there's a nostalgia amongst um, people of I guess our age and they're in their twenties and thirties who grew up with this kind of eight bit video game music, um, and it's it also seems like the music that and maybe it's that this is the music that these devices are capable of making, but you know even abstracted from the timbres, the music itself is more accessible i w- i think in in a in mm-hmm. it's a very tonal language it's it's a lot of four four stuff and there's some exceptions to that of course but it's it's generally uh i think more ap- approachable than the the entire universe of new music <laughs> as a whole yeah. than the average let's let's than put the it average. that way than yeah. than, yeah. than the than the accessibility median dave i i I want you to know that Sam was smiling a little bit when you said 20s and 30s. <laughs> well. I'm demonstrating. Sam, not, I still got all my hair. You're not, you're not, you're oh, nice nice oh, shot. You got a nice widow's peak going there. Yeah, but I've had that since I was 13, so no big deal. Sam, Sam doesn't look a day over 33, but he's actually like 48 90. or something. No, no. <laughs> I'll be 43 in December. I was I was oh. just kidding. Um. Also, Dave, I sent you a picture that, that I think you should show because uh, Land Me, that's the first time we've tried that out on air, Land Me, Los Angeles New Music Ensemble, does a good job of uh, kind of do the DIY promotion and the DIY animation. And this is a trend that, that we've talked about a lot for uh, new music ensembles. And we're going to talk about this kind of, you know, uh, sort of, new digital literacy and its effect on new music people later when we you talk put about that it. link in the doc i Please. put i sent it to accidentally sent it to you through so i don't google. i don't log on to i am on the production machine oh uh, okay sorry i'll do it right now but anyway you guys are are very good about uh you know taking care of all the stuff that in the past you would have had to have a full-on production company to help you take care of you know um and uh I was hoping we'd have this picture ready. Okay, Dave, I put it below the show order. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but this is just an awesome picture, a super awesome picture, and I thought we had to show this on the show um, because it's it, <laughs> it is, that's the Los Angeles New Music Ensemble, and Christine is is doing the the best part is Christine is doing the. I'm the pretty one, and I'm on my phone because <laughs> I don't have time to talk to these people, you know. 
I had to pull out my uh, inner And she's looking at the, at, at, like, what is this dude with the cello doing? Clearly I'm on the phone. Shut up so I can talk on the phone. Right, and Patrick, the composer, right next to her is thinking composerly thoughts, you know, and the self-absorbed cello guy is just sitting there playing. Oh, my God, they're always so self-absorbed, aren't they? (laughs) It's like the guy guy in the subway playing John Mayer tunes. That's it. So, anyway, that is an awesome picture. But um, Land Me is actually a non-profit, right? Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you just had anything to say about the the journey of starting a new music ensemble and uh, becoming a nonprofit and everything you've done. And in other words, I'm sure you've learned a lot about this process from when you started to now. So if you had some advice to some up and coming uh, new music ensemble people, what would it be? Yeah, it's um, definitely ups and downs have lo- learned a lot of things, made a lot of mistakes, uh, but the mistakes are also fun. Um, The first thing I would say is if you want to create a project, know you're not going to get any major funding for about three years. So your ensemble needs to be doing things for at least three years. Mm. Um, And then rather than applying for uh, nonprofit status through the government, just get a fiscal sponsor. So much easier. And it actually allows uh, a lot of fiscal sponsors uh, require that you put up your proposal first before you can send it out to the granting uh, agency, and they find all your mistakes, your typos, uh, your budget that didn't add up correctly, um, <laughs> things, just little things that you know you're thinking about the art and the music and the creation of new and exciting projects, and they're thinking about, okay, is this company actually going to give this group some money? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, definitely do the fiscal sponsor route. Um, I would also just say that uh, if you have an ensemble. Um, it would be easy to have uh, a little bit of work per person rather than having one person do all the work. Then everybody becomes invested. Uh, if you're one, if you're an ensemble or, you know, a performing group of any kind, not just music, uh, this is a way to get the community involved. And uh, they really, every time we do a concert and a lot of times we attempt to provide the music for free by getting some kind of grant money, uh, more people come out because they're happy that you're actually bringing music to the community. Mm-hmm. But I say, if you want to do it, do it. It is so worthwhile uh, and it's so rewarding. Mm. Wise words. Yeah, the, the thing of like, you got to just do it for a long time and sort of develop your own, uh, you know, a list of, you know, and you got to establish yourself even though you're not getting any kind of compensation for it. Kind of like what we're doing here on Sound Nation. <laughs> We've been doing it for almost three years now. I know. So time for the big bucks to start rolling in. That's right. Any minute now. (laughs) Any any minute. I I think I hear the the beeping of the the dump truck outside my apartment backing up. (laughs) And they're they're just going to dump the load of cash right on the driveway. (laughs) That's how it works. So when do you think that you're going to actually issue the call for scores for this next series of stuff? Probably December. Mm-hmm. Um, it would be for our June series again. And, um, you know, uh, the one thing I would say about the call for scores, I never thought this mattered until our first call. Um, if you're going to send in a recording, um, make sure the performance level is somewhat resembling the music on the page because, right. uh, uh, so we, we were, you know, we were very excited about many pieces and then you know, you don't want the audio clip to hinder your, I guess, appreciation for the music. But when the performers are okay, uh, it definitely changes, uh, you know, your perception of the song. Mm. Um, I mean, so yeah, yeah. you got to cycle through a hundred pieces. Yes, you need to you need to do whatever you can to make it easy to to, to hear yours in the right way. Yes, and MIDI's is fine, point. you know. Yeah. But, and, uh, and, well. And, and, I, I would I would say if if this is something that you're interested in in trying to learn how to do better, we had a great conversation with uh, Yoram Haber, who uh, it, it, it does great work with the American Composers Orchestra, and he gave us some really great advice for people that are submitting to these kinds of things. And one of the things he said was to even even if it's not the even if the first thing of your piece is not the most exciting piece of the whole work 
take a clip of something that's like really exciting and attention grabby and clip it out and put it as the first track on the CD and then put the whole thing as the second track. Oh, um, that's actually a really good idea. Wow. <laughs> Genius right there. I know, right? <laughs> we give you gold on Sound Notion. Beat. Gold, I tell you. Beat Two the system. Dump, uh, dump trucks are coming now. That's with right. Money. <laughs> in. There's, there's, there's two dump trucks outside right now. <laughs> so, Christina, when the album is ready, how is it going to be released? Uh, it's going to be through Centaur mm -hmm. uh, label. And so it will be available through uh, digital download, iTunes, iTunes. Um, and uh, as as well as hard, you know, hard copy. Can you say that for CD? Yeah, why not? Uh, yeah. But my goal is to uh, try and get this the album um, into uh, several libraries. And so with the interlibrary loan system, which I know I use all the time for recordings, uh, hopefully get some people picking up the album that might not purchase it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we'll probably do some kind of free download if you do some kind of donation uh thing so I, I we haven't selected a track yet or anything like that but right um, like a bonus track for a people bonus who... track yes there exactly okay um are there going to be any kind of uh non-traditional so you're doing the animation for the video and stuff and we had so percussion on last week and i, I wouldn't expect anyone to compete with the amount of like swag they're giving away as the packaging for their cd but are you gonna i wouldn't gonna say they're anything... giving it away <laughs> Is there going to be anything non-traditional about the uh, the packaging of the CD? Uh, you know, uh, I think this one is going to be tr pretty traditional. Uh, it's our first uh, album that we're releasing for commercial release. And um, so it's going to be very traditional. But I have always thought it would be awesome for a physical CD, for it, the actual CD to be something that's non-traditional, like a zip-up cover. Uh, or a bubble wrap. I always thought it would be really cool to get a CD and the cover itself is actually bubble wrap. Uh, <laughs> but this one's going to be just the same, you know, plastic. Well, with, me, with me, that wouldn't last long. <laughs> yeah. You pop, pop every one of them? Every yes, one exactly. Of them. Uh, so anyway, that sounds very exciting and we can't wait. So be sure and let us know. Um, does Los Angeles New Music Festival have any shows coming up that you can plug, or are you guys kind of done with the concert season for now? We're done for this uh, season, uh, but we are going to do a show in Santa Fe at St. John's College in the fall, and um, we're pretty much we pretty much play over the summer, but we might try and do a few concerts actually in uh, the spring semester, some university concerts. So, does everybody in the ensemble live in the same place, or do you? No, have to <laughs> it makes it very difficult. Um, you, I'm sure you all know, uh, music jobs are far, you know, and few. Um, and as soon as you get one, you hold on to it. Um, but our flute players actually uh, started her DMA and flute performance at North Texas. Um, and then our cellist has been uh, deciding where he wants to stay, but he actually got a residency at SMU in Dallas. Um, and then I'm between Los Angeles and Oklahoma. Um, and so, yes, we pretty much set a, a weekend and then we come together and practice and then we go back to our lives and then we practice really hard by ourselves and then come together and, you know, put on a few concerts. Right. Well, I, I think everybody's familiar with that. Um, you know, I've got my pieces being played in Italy and they've got a, you guys, oh, is it? you guys have to practice <laughs> when, when you come together. Christina is playing a piece of mine along with. Keith Lemons and my lovely wife, Megan Mercier's at the international clarinet thing in Italy this summer. And uh, so I'm, I'm actually pretty tense about the long distance practicing. <laughs> it's oh, not an easy good. piece. I promise. Gonna be, I, I'm a hundred percent confident. <laughs> you don't sound um, very confident. I think you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> so Christina, the next thing you guys need to do is get into some new music on uh, festivals. Mm -hmm. And Dave, uh, if I am, I'm right, there's uh, the London Contemporary Music Festival. This is the first one up. of these bad boys. They I just, know. They and just this week announced their program, and I, I made a silly joke on, on Twitter about it um, that it includes Wagner, and they're calling it a Contemporary Music Festival. I, that was just a joke. They they actually have like a legit, pretty compelling program that includes Wagner um, on uh, that's kind of a 
about redefining opera and I, I guess Wagner is kind of like the starting point maybe um, but the, they have some really great stuff they've got uh, this is just at the end of July starting at the end of July running through the beginning of August in, in London and it sounds really interesting it's, it's all free you do have to if you're going to go though it seems like you have to book your ticket even though it's free just for space um, so if that's something that sounds like something you want to do, you should definitely check it out because they've got some, some really cool sounding programs. Uh, you know, everybody from, from Laurie Anderson, uh, to Kurtog, Lamont to Young. Glass, to, uh, you know, uh, there's, uh, some Ligeti on here. There's some, uh, Jevsky on Lockerman. here. There's, there's, yeah, there's and there's some weird buddy. stuff. There's, there's, there's weirder stuff. There's Helmut Lockenman. There's, uh, Fernie Howe. There's Michael Finnessy. It sounds like a great festival, actually, now that I'm saying all these things out loud. Um, and I'm totally jealous of all those people that are going to go get to hear this stuff, especially since they're going to go get to hear it all for free. Um, and a bunch of new works, too. Some, some, some premieres on there, uh, some stuff from this year and some world premieres at the festival. So, uh, I'm totally jealous of all the people that are going to get to hear this, and you should you should definitely check it out. And you can still make fun of them a little bit for having Fogger on their program, but know that it's just a joke. All right, that's what blew me away, Dave, because I saw your your tweet poking at them, and I didn't look at the festival at all after that. I just like, oh, that is funny, you know, they're doing Wagner, but that's a heavyweight program. Oh yeah, I mean, there's a lot of like super serious like badass rep programs that that i would totally go see if i were in london yeah so, so check that out if you're across the pond or if you're rich and can afford to fly over there right yeah <laughs> i'm, um, I'm gonna i'm working off one screen today today dave you're gonna have to all right me. i was i was i was hoping you were gonna have a, a slick uh a slick segue but alas I'm, I'm, I'm on one screen. I, it's it's wearing me out. Well, your your technology limitations notwithstanding, you know who, who doesn't, doesn't have technology I was gonna, limitations? Oh, thank you. That's where I was going. Oh. Setting them up and knocking them down. Patrick Gula, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. You know who doesn't have technology limitations is the New York Metropolitan Opera. Uh, there's a, a really interesting piece in the New York Times this week. Uh, apparently, there was a little uh, kerfuffle over the the use of. I'm going to go with audio Body reinforcement uh, at the Metropolitan Opera, as as I'm sure our audience is well aware. Um, the opera crowd is not a fan of uh, audio reinforcement because these singers have trained their whole lives to make these giant sounds that don't need any audio reinforcement. Um, now, there are obviously, especially in contemporary opera, composers that call for some kind of amplification simply because they they want the sounds the the other characteristics of the singer's voice that don't happen or aren't apparent at the the louder range uh and so there's amplification so they don't have to sing that loud like john adams is, is kind of famous for this um but apparently there were some singers that were there was a microphone that was caught red-handed in a photograph <laughs> Uh, amplifying one of the sopranos on stage in a dress rehearsal, and everybody like freaked out. And I, I guess that's a thing. But uh, the the article points out, and I think this is this is definitely the case that a lot of these microphones are mostly used for the benefit of the live and HD broadcasts and the radio broadcasts. Um, just to capture the voices, not to amplify them in the hall, but to capture them and put them into the, the broadcast. And I think that uh, explains a lot about my experience with the ring cycle. I, I remember reading the reviews of the Robert Lepage ring cycle that just ended last year, and everybody was complaining that the machine, the big set machine with the, the giant kind of pieces that spin around and have projections and stuff everybody w was complaining in the reviews that the machine was super loud and distracting in the hall and i remember thinking that when i went to see it in the movie theater in michigan that i didn't hear any of that at all and it sounded fine to me and it, it now i think that the reason that was is that the all the singers were close mic'd 
uh, so that you only heard their voices and you didn't hear the sound of this machine in the basement that was turning these, you know, seven tons of whatever opera sets are made out of. Uh, so I, what did you say, Patrick? What are they made out tricky. of? Tricky. I said that's that's tricky. I know. So I don't. Do you, are you guys? I, Sam, I know you're not offended by this. Sam, Sam, you, I, I would imagine, are like John Adams would prefer that the singers actually make their vocal sounds a little softer and use the microphone so that they don't make those those giant well, opera sounds with their voices, right? I'm I'm looking forward to a time when a, a composer can get a write an opera that can be performed by one of the biggest companies in the world and doesn't have to have those okay let's i i'm i'm waiting for a time when a composer can simply write an opera that will be performed (laughs) by one of the biggest opera companies in the world that already is a rarity right i think michelle vandera so i'm i'm not saying it never happens yeah well i i've already put forth on the i put forth on the show many times that that i find pop voices a lot more interesting typically than bel canto style singing because you know, it's, people will argue against this, I know, but Bill Canto's style singing is you're going for an artifact sound at least way more than you are with a pop vocalist. With a pop vocalist, everything about the sound is about the personality of their voice. They're not trying to make it sound like any kind of thing that came before, mm-hmm. necessarily. Um, and that's an interesting thing to me, but those people aren't trained their whole life to shout over an orchestra, you know. So miking is a, it would open up a huge world of different kinds of vocal color to me. And having the option to uh, do an opera where everybody can be mic'd on stage is, is an interesting proposition, you know. And at what point do composers start thinking about that when they write their opera, you know? Do you think that – so you, you keep talking about these singers that are going for this artifact sound as though they're all trying to sound the same. And I'm not sure that that is true. I, I, don't I don't think, think it's any more like- true than all clarinet players – than saying all clarinet players are trying to sound the same. Well, more, all clarinet players are trying to sound, uh, classical clarinet players are trying to sound a lot more the same than jazz saxophonists are trying to sound the same. That's what I'm getting at. I suppose. Well, I'll, we, I, we don't have time to style. argue about it right I, now, but I'm, I'm positive I'm right. <laughs> well, okay. then let's just not argue because that would just be a waste of my time. Anyway, I think it's a great, I mean, I would love to see more of this kind of thing and the things that would be possible doing it this way. So, because hearing somebody sing very softly in a sotto voce kind of thing that is then amplified super loud, you can't, you can't have that sound in a performance hall without amplification. Well, and this, this actually reminds me of something we were talking to Christina about at the beginning of the show, playing in bars. Christina, when you guys play in situations like that, you said you got just kept playing louder. Have you ever tried that kind of performance using microphones and amplifying your instruments? And, and how's that change things for you? Yeah, you know, I'm a fan of technology in general. Uh, I also like to play a lot of electroacoustic music. Um, yes, I've used microphones. Um, the concert we did, uh, classical concerts usually don't have a tech person. But if you play in a bar that's more set up for, you know, pop music, like Sam was talking about, with, you know, looking for color of pop voices, they actually do a really good job amplifying classical musicians. Um, so I have played using microphone setup, um, but uh, obviously for a classical, you know, contemporary ensemble, bringing a tech person around can be difficult. So, yes, I say go technology. All right. <laughs> So, but and and also, I would say that unlike a lot of pop musicians, classical musicians don't tend to own as much gear, right? Right. So you have to really rely on the venue, not just to have somebody that knows how to run the 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 the, the, the stuff, but actually to have it. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, which that is... brings up another pet peeve of mine. <laughs> <laughs> like, who who here took a music technology class of some description in either undergraduate or graduate school? Everybody did, you sure. know. Did anybody learn anything about microphones or PA systems in that? I, I learned, doubt it. I learned how to make feathered memes in Sibelius. <laughs> yeah. So, no. it, like, yeah. the music I just technology used, I just class, learned software. Yeah. I learned, that's what I learned, too, is software, primarily and finale. Seriously, like, a week or two of workshopping live audio. We don't want to create experts, but, like, imagine if all classically trained musicians 
could take like a portable PA system and knew how to plug this into that and make it go, you know, and and be safe with it and not blow it up, you know. That's a valuable t skill. That sounds like for, that sounds like a a a service that Sound Ocean TV should offer uh, the classical like community at large in video yeah. format. I think so. We've discussed just that. Well, let's do it. Well, we need to take a lazy get off your butt pill, and then we will. In so many ways. Yes. Um, speaking of technology changing the way things happen. Hey -o. Hey -o. Um, <laughs> Coursera, which is an online, uh, they offer online courses in just about anything you can think of, I think. Um, oh, yeah. They're a, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Awesome story. There's a uh, story out of what is this? The this is just from them, basically. It's their oh, okay, their yeah. PR. Yeah. So they're they've they've uh, teamed up with the Curtis Institute of Music uh, and are offering two different online what they call music appreciation courses. And so far, twenty four thousand people have signed up between these uh, two courses. Right. I should and say so that I am among those twenty four thousand people. I've, right. I signed up for these when I first looked into Coursera a couple couple months back, uh, and and the one that, that particularly interests me starts September 3rd is called Exploring Beethoven's Piano Sonatas, um, and it seems like that I, I recently read a thing from them that said they're going to have kind of two tracks. They're going to have the one for people that know a little music theory, and then one for like normals. That yeah. is more music appreciation-y, more like pre-concert lecture-y, uh, as as I interpreted their so, their so, statement. So they didn't they that, didn't use the word lecture-y because one. they are professionals. <laughs> um, but what were you saying, Patrick? I was gonna say you're you're taking the latter one, right? Right, right. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm taking the uh, the dummy track. I shouldn't say that because it's totally normal. Uh, more accurately described as the normals track. No, um, but and then the other one is is from the repertoire Western music history through performance, which sounds to me like music appreciation, uh, and hopefully will be better. Uh, through performance leads me to believe that they might actually have like performances by Curtis faculty be, and students, which could be pretty be, good. Or it'll be like anecdotal information about performances. <laughs> Yeah, that's what we need. Anecdotal information about the form. So these are these massively open online courses that they can deal with these tens of thousands of students because there's a lot of peer evaluation. There's the, the instructor doesn't really grade anything in, in, the, in these kinds of courses. But it's cool, I think, just to observe that there are this many people that are interested in learning about these things recreationally for, for mm. basically no credit, though it helps that it is also basically no money uh, to do that. But... I think it's, interesting. It's, it's very promising. It's interesting, and the article points out that the Curtis Institute is this exclusive music school with a very small, like, group of students. Yeah. And this music appreciation class is twenty four thousand. Is the opposite strong. of that. Yeah, and and I know that Christina has experience um, teaching music appreciation, and the joke in the doc is, "How would you like to read all those performance evaluations?" <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm on fourteen thousand nine hundred and eighty. I definitely wouldn't get, I would get to like three and then I would start crying. Yeah, well, it doesn't take much with those things. And not because people don't know about music, but because college students these days can't form coherent sentences. Well, let's not get on a rant about <laughs> how people can't write, because that could be the rest of the show and then the it, next six shows. It could be. <laughs> uh, another uh, thing regarding technology this week... Um, Usually, uh, Rob Deemer has some interesting, uh, thought-provoking topics. Um, this one, I mean, it's thought-provoking, but he, he just kind of presents it and lets us come up with what we want to say about it. Um, he's, uh, for the third year in a row, teaching at Interlock and Summer Camp for the Arts uh, and teaching composition, along with uh, two cohorts, who are uh, Jonathan Newman and... Uh, Robert Nolan. Brownlow. Yeah. And N. Lincoln Hanks. N. Lincoln Hanks. Um, doing the H. Ross Perot format on the name there. It makes there you, you sound go. smarter. Um, but the, the, the piece in uh, New Music Box this week is, is really just about how effective it can be using um, video in correlation with, like, in the context of a master class where you're trying to introduce people to your music. Um, uh, the piece by uh, 
one of the pieces is just a sheet of the score going by until it's time to turn the page. So basically it's like projecting the, the whole score, score, the whole score and turning the page for you instead of doing the, the awkward uh, here, I've only got eight copies of the score. Everybody scoot around and gather around this one music stand. And then the person <laughs> who's turning the pages feels all the pressure to know where to turn the pages. I'm sure we've all been in that situation where it's some kind of really weird contemporary music. And you're like, Holy crap. Is this where I turned the page? I don't know. Um, that's like the most the other, stressful thing about composer masterclasses is be, is the the possibility that it could be you who's in charge of turning all the pages for sixteen people. Yeah, <laughs> not a fan. Um, and then the other one is actually a lot more uh, involved. Uh, Jonathan Newman's piece for wind orchestra, I think, is what they call it. Um, and instead of just kind of following the score along, he's cutting and dodging to different spots he wants you to recognize. So. When the trombones have glissandi, he cuts to just that bar with the glissandi. And when you want to see the, you know, the, the classical counterpoint going on in the woodwinds or whatever, it'll cut to a brick of that. So he's really highlighting the things that he thinks are important in his piece. It, it, to me, that's just an interesting and and really, I think it's a a, a effective and uh, labor uh, a good labor saving way to introduce people to your music and that kind of hi, I'm the composer. Here's my music kind of masterclass deal. Um, but as a side effect, if as let's assume composers think this is a good idea, which I think they should, um, Rob points out that, you know, as composers become more familiar with this technology and it just becomes super easy to use, you know, um, composers might start integrating this, not just into something like a masterclass, but actually integrate it into their pieces. Because why wouldn't you, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, uh, I, it seems like, and Sam, you and I have talked about this before, that listening to music, especially for the first time with the score in front of you, and listening to music for the first time without the score in front of you, is a very different thing. And having that, uh, that initial experience being with the score, I think you'll, you hear certain things that you're seeing that you, that may have, the, it surfaces some of the background elements of the music that you may not have caught if you if you weren't w watching and listening for them when you heard them, and that's something that I noticed in this this Jonathan Newman one, uh, where he's following these little individual bits of the of the score as opposed to showing you the whole page of a wind ensemble score. He's showing you one or two or six lines at a time. Why don't you play twenty seconds or so of that for the video viewers, Dave? Yeah, sure. Get an idea of what we're talking about. This is uh, this is blow it up and start blow it up start again by Jonathan Newman, uh, which begins with a great Guy Fox epigram. <laughs> So get your iMovie on, right? Everybody got that? <laughs> get your iMovie on. Yeah, and and while all that, that none of that stuff is beyond the capabilities of a dedicated person who wants to learn how to do it. It must take that, forever to cut and clip though on like a long piece, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, that that is some work cuz that cuts so much. That is some yeah. work. To, and to, and, this, get and, all that. and this is just a 4 minute piece. Imagine doing that for like an 8 or 12 minute piece. I don't think that I would be quite so frenetically changing around. <laughs> That's <laughs> true, and the, the freneticness of the cutting does kind of match the music. Yeah. You wouldn't do, yeah. you wouldn't cut around like that on a gentler sounding piece. Right, right. So but, it kind of demands that kind of video editing. But I think it's a good way because this is this was part of a situ This was you know part of a presentation where you're introducing yourself as a composer and your your body of work to a bunch of people who don't know anything about you and and may not know a ton about uh, reading a big score. I mean, th this is a presentation for, for students who, who may not have spent a lot of time looking at a, a wind ensemble score. And if you've never done that, that's a really intimidating thing, is, you know, 43 staves systems um, is, is pretty intimidating. And, and I also like it, uh, it's kind of described in here as something that he does to is kind of like a demo 
kind of thing for band directors. I think that can be a really interesting thing for people that are wondering if this is a piece that they would like to perform to like have those little bits of the score pop up. How often have, have, have you, you know, heard a piece of music and thought, Oh, this sounds great. I could, I could totally play that. I, I want to see the score. And then you look at the score and you're like, Oh crap, I have no idea where to begin. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I have that experience all the time as a performer, um, and and I would imagine that that's something that that any performer, especially that is interested in new music, has had, where the the way it, or or the opposite, you know, you you look at the score and you think, well, that sounds pretty doable, and then you listen to it and it sounds incredibly difficult. Right. So, Christina, when you come across this. When Los Angeles New Music Ensemble starts receiving scores for their next call, do you, how do you think you'd respond to somebody to giving a you a, MIDI, a YouTube video with a MIDI performance where they're highlighting the score that way? I think I, that would be pretty... That would be very interesting. You know, when you're looking at uh, scores, after a while you're starting to look at the same thing in the same format. And, you know, the exciting thing is, oh my gosh, it's a different font. Uh, <laughs> it might be very exciting to actually have something that's completely different, you know. You know, yeah. YouTube video, or even if a PowerPoint, you know, presentation sent to you or something. Yeah, interesting. Okay. <laughs> so you know, there you go. Tips, pro tips for <laughs> submitting to the Los Angeles New Music Ensemble. Don't use Times New Roman, and <laughs> maybe make a PowerPoint video thing. Right. You know, it's interesting to me uh, that even if a composer doesn't decide to use this in any of their own creative work, if they have a familiar if they're familiar with how video editing works, even in a rudimental way enough to make something like that, their ability to collaborate with a video artist is greatly enhanced. You know, because it helps you go back and forth with the person and helps you understand where they're coming from. Because at the very least, you understand the basics of how to put something like that together and the kinds of technical concerns they're going to be dealing with during the process. So it's, 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 well, I guess it's just a digital literacy thing. We should sure. be training our students better in undergraduate school. Well, that, there you go. That, that's, we'll fix that too. When we do the, when we do the microphone right. thing, we'll, we'll, we'll fix the digital thing too. Right. And that's right. Piece. Right. That's right. We're going to, we're just going to fix everything. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so Dave, do you know that, uh, typically when I whip it, do you know how I like to whip it? Um, I would say well. since you are are <laughs> <laughs> since I, I think I think Patrick has the right answer there that that you whip it well, um, but <laughs> being the being the, the the talented whippist that you are and unencumbered by proper grammar and unencumbered by proper grammar, uh, I would say that you whip it good. Whip it good. Uh, rest in peace, Alan Myers, the drummer for Devo. Um, you know, we, sometimes on the show we, we have little kerfuffles over who we are and aren't going to include in the obit section. But, um, you know, uh, Devo was kind of like a cartoon version of punk music. <laughs> and they, to me, they're important because they showed up on MTV when MTV was new. So this is the first time you get sort of uh, just, you know, they were just really weird guys who seemed to do weird stuff just for the sake of being weird and uh and if you don't so, like if you don't like people who are weird for the for weirdness's sake then you cannot watch our show that's right <laughs> anyway an influential band who kind of like uh showed us how how to be uh you know overtly weird and make videos about it and really uh, revel in that weirdness and really revel in that weirdness with the goggles and, and, and the hats and, you know, anytime there's a group of four friends in college who are trying to decide what to dress up for Halloween, um, if they've got access to something that resembles those goofy hats from the Whippet video, there you go. We're, we're Devo from the Whippet video. Black shirts and orange pants and red, like, I like don't know, like... pyramid things. They look like, like a, a, you know, hors d'oeuvre serving trays or something on their head. Yes, that's what they should be. <laughs> and if you're if you're hosting the party, you need to have those hors d'oeuvres, right, right? Exactly. And then uh, also rest in peace. We 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 don't want to belittle an actual human being, so uh, we're not saying these things are exactly the same. But also rest in peace. The Steinway Showroom. Uh, we've covered uh, still exists. Several times. It still exists, and uh, as we've covered on the show, they've been in the process of trying to offload the showroom 
due to financial reasons. And even though they're going to be in the building, I don't know, like for like another year or something, through September 2014. And they can extend um, that even after that, but right. I think it's going to go the, away eventually. They're still looking. Had, I, as far as I know, they're still looking for a new place. They haven't found a new place, or they haven't right. announced it if they have. Right. Mm. So and uh, if you if you have it, some choice real estate in Manhattan that you think would make a great Steinway showroom, give give them a call. Yeah. And it also it's funny that they mentioned they have the, even the Steinway the property here has the the rights and I'm not sure how this works in New York Patrick maybe you do <laughs> but there's like you have to you can't just build as big a building as you want you know and uh, but they I can are, make that yes. structure taller right there are air rights buy, or something yes there's air air rights and space like you're paying for the for the vertical square footage. Not uh, like in the in the I air, think not it's just cubic footage. Once you start going vertical, yeah, oh yeah, I guess so. Z axis a... represent. <laughs> <laughs> There's the show title. Z axis represent. So I think it's time, Sam, and you don't have a thing, so you're gonna have to fake it. Uh, I can't fake it. Okay, oh. well, it's the pick of the week time, and Sam doesn't have his his. Sam is is joining us under duress from the field. <laughs> Uh, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, so he does not have his fancy machine thing that makes the noise. Um, but our pick of the week this week is uh, from the Los Angeles New Music Ensemble, as we have learned today, said Land Me, um, performing a track from their new album called Mini Boss. Christina, do you want to say anything to set this up before we listen to it? Yeah, so uh, I guess I was talking about fonts and what makes something exciting. So when we got right. our score for this, this is actually what we saw. Awesome. Ooh. Nice. <laughs> awesome. Um, I'm nostalgia-ing right now. Yes. Oh, thank you. That looks much better than me holding <laughs> up a printed piece of paper. So that's what it looks like. It looks like a video game title. Exactly. Very nice. Uh, so uh, this is actually for uh, our quartet. Uh, but with the inclusion of uh, Game Boy. And uh, so Joseph has actually done a really great job putting this together. This is what he calls, uh, you know, 8-bit music or chip music for the modern concert hall. Um, and uh, it is actually asked when you perform it to actually have the musicians amplified. So to play into uh, some kind of uh, microphone. Uh, we, uh, when we played it, we did not play with microphones. Uh, with the exception of one overhead one. But our next performance will have four microphones, one for each instrument. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, the one that really exciting thing about this piece, actually, there's many exciting things. The thing I found most exciting was, remember back in the day when you would put in your little cheat codes, uh, you know, to get to the last level? Or, up, up, uh, down, down, left, right, left, right. Yeah. Exactly. That's the one. That's <laughs> actually That's the, the one. It's the Konami codes. I know. Yes, uh, so the clarinet, when the clarinet enters, uh, it's actually playing that code. Um, and so, yes, what you hear is um, I'm playing the same note, but uh, you can play them on different sides. So you have a right C key and a left C key. So when it's going right, left, right, left, I'm switching. So you should hear the little <laughs> flippy sound of me switching uh, sides and then going up and down. Uh. That'd okay, be a great so I read the, the thing that it was playing the Konami code, and I was like, I don't understand how the Konami code is represented by this line. So it's act like you're actually doing the motions of the, yes. with your fingers on the clarinet. That's amazing. Exactly. That's hilarious. <laughs> All right, so this is it. This is we're gonna play uh, an excerpt from the beginning of uh, Mini Boss by, and I don't want to mispronounce this guy's name. You said it earlier, and it was different than the way I was saying it in my head. Is it Eadson? Eadson. Okay. So, Joseph Eadson, uh, Mini Boss, performed by the Los Angeles New Music Ensemble and a sweet Game Boy.
So that was an excerpt from Mini Boss by Joseph Eason, performed by the Los Angeles New Music Ensemble, which includes our guest, Christina Giacona. And I should say that when the clarinet came in, after hearing the explanation of how the Konami code is represented, when, when Sam heard it, Sam, <laughs> Sam started nodding his head and going, yeah, I get this. Yeah, right? yeah absolutely. You could, you could totally hear it happen. Um, and it's funny because, you know, you have to work to make that audible because if you go real smooth and don't do anything, you can play left and right handed C and not hear anything. So you have to actually work to make there be something there and you could hear, you know, you could hear it. It's nice. Yeah, no, I definitely uh, had to work to get the sound to flip because, I mean, I have a professional level clarinet and it's specifically <laughs> set up to not make that sound. Right. So I cheated so a get, little bit. So you need, but... to, you need to get your bandy out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I had an old Bundy. Oh, Bundy, that would, sorry. It would that's be a... like two different notes. Be like, ear, yeah. ear, ear. <laughs> right. just, for that, just for that measure. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and then it. I'll switch back. You get That's one of those it. plastic ones. It's like bright green or something. <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah. So, so, so this is a piece you you're actually performing this. I, when you perform this, do you do it with a Game Boy or do you do it with a CD with uh, a recording? We when we performed it this last summer, we actually did it through iPod through an iPod. Yeah. Um, and so he actually uh, set it up uh, really nicely, so you can do it either way. Our next performance will be with Game Boy because everybody in the group, except for me, actually still has their Game Boy. <laughs> wow. And so we yeah. thought it'd be really fun to pull it up on stage. Man, I'm jealous. I don't have my Game Boy anymore. That's awesome. So what, I, I wonder what the, if the reaction, if, if the reception of, of a piece like this uh, is different, if the audience actually sees like the big, chunky, gray Game Boy on stage. That would be, that would be interesting. Yeah, what's actually difficult about performing this piece, uh, keep in mind that everybody in my group is a ham. Um, there are sections of time when the musicians don't play. And so you actually have to sit up there and you're grooving along, you know, you're tapping your head. And so most classical musicians uh, don't get into that, but uh, we had some cool dance moves going on. <laughs> you, should, you should get out, people who aren't playing for a while should get out a Game Boy and start playing a game. That would be fun too. <laughs> that would be good. Well, I, I can't wait to hear the rest of the album, which will be coming out. Remind us again, most likely hitting the stores in September. Okay, and we'll have it when that comes out. We'll be sure and put a link up on the uh, Sound Notion website for everyone. Great. Thank and, you. and before we we wrap up, where can people find more about uh, Land Me and you, Christina, and all the things you guys have going on? Uh, the best way to, to find out what's going on is just through our website, which is actually L A N M E, so Land Me uh, dot org. Uh, and then we have a Facebook page as well. Um, and we'll post new things. Uh, and then we're actually going to update our um, uh, YouTube page with some videos, especially when we have our music video coming up. Excellent. Can't, I cannot wait to see this music video. It sounds, <laughs> it sounds like it's going to be really pretty amazing. I think. And their performance, is the performance of NC on your YouTube channel? It's not, but I actually probably should uh, put like a link or something. I, I I've found it before. I'll put a link in it since I've yeah. mentioned, and and I'm so, I'm pushing it so hard because it's a really nice. It's so loud and crazy. It's awesome. it is so loud. And I remember I was standing next to a Barry saxophonist, and he was playing fortissimo the entire time. About three fourths of the way through, <laughs> looked over at me and says, "I think I'm gonna pass out." <laughs> I was like, "Piano, let's play piano." I think yeah, I so think it's he wouldn't be the first person to pass out during a performance of NC. I think yes, right. <laughs> Did now you guys invited other musicians to come and play with you for that, right? For yeah, we actually it was um, us and then the Paul Bailey Ensemble, mm. and then we actually just put uh, we sent an email out to anybody we think we could think that might be interested, uh, and it actually started at midnight in a Mexican bar. <laughs> awesome, nice. that's the way to do it. Well, Very that's nice. gonna do it for this week's Sound Notion. Uh, if you would like to read about any of the stories we talked about today, if you want to find links to Land Me and all the cool projects that they have going on, you can find all of that stuff on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN. Um, you can also connect with us on Facebook or Twitter. We'd love to continue these conversations with you wherever you like to continue conversations. You Like us on Facebook, like Land Me on Facebook, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, 
follow us on Twitter. We're at Sound Notion as a group. I'm at Dave McDowell. Sam is at House Goy, and Patrick is at Vox Shibuya. Uh, subscribe to this show and all our shows at Sound Notion TV in the iTunes Store. Uh, you can support us using the Amazon affiliate search box on our site uh, on the right hand side there's a little Amazon thing if you're buying whatever junk you normally buy on Amazon if you find it through that little box it won't cost you anymore but we get a, a tiny commission that helps us out a lot uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Left. thanks again for watching and we will see you well we will not see you back next week whoa that was close <laughs> we're taking next week off for the holidays if, if, you, if you're not in the United States uh, then you're just going to have to and deal with the fact be. that we are. And uh, we're taking the uh, Independence Day holiday weekend off. So we will see you back in two weeks. Land me. <laughs>